Arguing against the resurrection of Jesus Christ tonight will be Dr. Robert Greg Cavan. You might say that Dr. Cavan maintains the home court advantage here. He is currently a humanities lecturer at UC Irvine and earned his Master of Arts and Doctorate in Philosophy under Nelson Pike here on this campus. In addition to those degrees, Dr. Cavan holds a Master's Degree in Theology from Fuller Theological Seminary and a Bachelor of Arts in Religion from USC. It was Dr. Cavan's provocative doctoral dissertation on the resurrection and several articles that he has uh, since spun off of that dissertation that spurred several of us toward working to bring these scholars together. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Cavan to the Bren Center this evening. On my right is Dr. William Lane Craig. He will be arguing for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he's visiting Southern California tonight from his new hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, where he's a visiting scholar at Emory University. Dr. Craig holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Birmingham in England and a doctorate in theology from the University of Munich where he studied under Wolfhard Pannenberg. Dr. Craig has written scores of published articles uh, in professional journals such as New Testament Studies, Journal for the Study of the New Testament, and so on. And he's published several books, including Assessing the New Testament Evidence for the Resurrection of Jesus. In addition, he has spent the last seven years as a visiting scholar at the University of Louvain in Belgium. Please join me in welcoming both of tonight's distinguished speakers. And up first, by prior agreement of the debaters, will be Dr. William Lane Craig with a 20-minute opening statement making the case for the resurrection. Dr. Craig. Thank you. Good evening. Let me begin by expressing my appreciation to Campus Crusade for Christ for inviting me to participate in this evening's important debate. In tonight's debate, we're going to be talking about whether it is rational to believe on the basis of the historical evidence that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. Our answer to that question does not preclude that there may be other grounds besides historical ones which make it rational to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. For example, one's experience of Christ as a living personal reality in one's life today. Tonight, however, our focus is going to be historical. Fortunately, Greg Cavan and I pretty much agree on what the specific historical facts are, which serve as evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So I don't need to review these in tonight's debate. By way of summary, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection can be grouped under three main headings. The empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus after his death, and the origin of the Christian faith. With respect to the empty tomb, we agree that Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers early Sunday morning and was thereafter inspected by the disciples. With regard to the appearances, we agree that various individuals and groups of people saw physical, bodily appearances of Jesus alive after his death on several occasions and under various circumstances. With respect to the origin of the Christian faith, we agree that the Christian movement came into being because the original disciples sincerely and firmly believed that God had raised Jesus from the dead, a belief unparalleled in antecedent Judaism and even contrary to Jewish beliefs. Now I realize that many of you would probably like to hear the specific evidence for these three facts, which time doesn't permit me to go into, but at the end of this debate, you'll have an opportunity to get a free brochure which outlines some of this evidence. Tonight, however, since Greg and I agree on these three basic, independently established facts, I'm going to take them as given. Where Greg and I differ is on what is the best explanation for these facts. I maintain that the best explanation for these facts, given the historical context in which they occurred, is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Greg, on the other hand, has developed an alternate theory which is, to say the least, very novel 
he proposes that Jesus had an unknown identical twin who impersonated Jesus after the crucifixion, thereby convincing people that he was risen from the dead. Remember the movie Dave? You know the one where the uh, presidential double takes over the U.S. presidency uh, when the real president falls into a coma? Well, Greg's theory is a sort of Dave theory of the resurrection. Jesus' unknown twin stole Jesus' body out of the tomb and impersonated Jesus before the disciples. Now, if you're wondering why uh, nobody knew about Jesus' twin brother, that's because, on Greg's theory, unbeknownst to Mary and Joseph, their real baby got accidentally switched with one member of a pair of identical twins. So the person that we call Jesus uh, wasn't really Mary's child at all, and his twin brother grew up independently of him. Now, Dave's theories make great comedy, but nobody takes them seriously as history. Greg will attempt to make his theory credible, I think, by sharing all sorts of very fascinating cases of twins uh, separated at birth, of mistaken identities of twins, and so forth. But all of this is really just fancy window dressing to conceal the fact that in the specific case of Jesus' resurrection, the Dave theory is pure imagination without a single piece of evidence. In fact, Greg admits that the chances of his Dave's theory being uh, true are extremely small. The only reason, the only reason that he thinks that it is better than the resurrection theory is because the resurrection theory is logically fallacious. Well, what then is the problem with the resurrection theory? Greg's main objection is that I fail to assess the probability of the resurrection relative to our background knowledge of the world. Unless we do that, we cannot use a particular formula from probability theory, which is called Bayes' theorem, to determine whether the resurrection theory is more probable than the Dave theory. Unless the resurrection theory conforms to Bayes' theorem, Greg says, it can't have any probability at all of being true. Now, Greg is a philosopher of science. He is not a historian. And the fact is that Bayes' theorem is just not the method used by historians in assessing historical hypotheses. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, the historian Ian McCullough explains that there are several views about how historical inferences are properly made. One view is essentially Greg's view, that historians justify their hypotheses about the past by estimating their probability and showing that it is high. But according to McCullough, this is a view which, in his words, has received little support in recent years. Moreover, McCullough points out, even according to this view, historians do not calculate the probability of historical hypotheses by using Bayes' theorem. And this is for two reasons. Number one, the information necessary to estimate the various probabilities is not available. This is precisely the problem, for example, in trying to assess the probability of the resurrection relative to our background information alone. If you set to one side all of the specific evidence for the resurrection, such as the empty tomb and the appearances of Jesus, and just consider our background knowledge of the world, including the historical facts leading up to Jesus' burial, and ask yourself, what is the probability that God would raise Jesus from the dead relative to that background information alone? How do you answer that question? As far as I can see, we just don't know how to assess that kind of probability with any sort of confidence. How do we know what God would do, given that background information? It seems that we have no firm idea of the probability of the resurrection relative to background information alone. Secondly, sometimes the results of using Bayes' theorem are unacceptable. McCullough gives examples of where correct historical descriptions would be invalidated by the use of Bayes' theorem. Hence he concludes, and I quote, 
Virtually no historian has used Bayes' theorem in justifying historical descriptions. So what Greg is actually trying to do is to impose a model of justifying historical hypotheses which virtually all professional historians reject. Well, how then do real historians justify historical hypotheses? McCullough explains that most historians use what is called inference to the best explanation. That is to say, they adopt that hypothesis which, if true, best explains the available evidence. What criteria determine which explanation is the best? McCullough lists six. The best explanation, number one, has greater explanatory scope than rival hypotheses. Number two, it has greater explanatory power than rival hypotheses. Number three, it is more plausible than rival hypotheses. Number four, it is less ad hoc than rival hypotheses. Number five, it is disconfirmed by fewer accepted beliefs than rival hypotheses. And six, it exceeds its rivals in meeting conditions one to five to such a degree that there's little chance of their turning out to be better after further investigation. This is the approach which I've taken to the resurrection of Jesus. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead meets all of the criteria explained by McCullough. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, number one, has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty, why the disciples saw post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and why the Christian faith came into being. Number two, it has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was gone why people repeatedly saw Jesus alive despite his earlier public execution and so forth. Three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and personal claims, the resurrection serves as a divine confirmation of Jesus' radical claims to be the unique son and absolute revelation of God. Number four, it is not ad hoc. It requires principally only one additional supposition, namely, that God exists. And even that need not be an additional supposition if you already believe in God. Number five, it is not disconfirmed by any accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, is not in any way disconfirmed by the belief that people don't rise from the dead by any natural means. Such naturalistic considerations have no bearing on and are entirely irrelevant to the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And number six, it far outstrips any of its rival theories in meeting conditions one to five. Compare, for example, the resurrection theory to Greg's Dave theory. The Dave theory, number one, has weaker explanatory scope. The Dave theory has to be conjoined with the independent hallucination theory in order to explain Jesus' appearance to the Apostle Paul. Number two, it has weaker explanatory power. The Dave theory cannot explain many aspects of the historical evidence. For example, two of them. A the supernatural character of the appearances. Every New Testament scholar agrees that the appearances were not like the ordinary presence of the earthly Jesus. Rather, they had a numinous quality about them. And Jesus was able to appear out of thin air. Usually, I have to argue strenuously with my New Testament colleagues in order to convince them that there was anything physical about these appearances at all. Greg's view of the appearances as the ordinary presence of any old human being is really a retrogression back to 19th century rationalism and would be unanimously rejected by contemporary scholarship. B. The wounds of the crucifixion. The Dave theory offers nothing to explain the risen Jesus's pierced hands and feet and his side which had been thrust through by a Roman lance 
those scars are the guarantee that the crucified Jesus is identical with the risen Lord. Now, Greg tries to avoid these weaknesses by denying the historicity of selected key aspects of the resurrection narratives. For example, uh, Jesus' appearance on the road to Emmaus, where he suddenly vanishes and then appears to Peter back in Jerusalem. But these aspects are not confined to the Emmaus story. The supernatural character of the appearances is independently attested in various traditions, in Mark, Luke, John, and Paul. The scars of the crucifixion are independently attested in traditions in Luke and John and intimated in the book of Revelation. Thus they are part of the evidence to be explained and the Dave theory is impotent to account for them. Number three, the Dave theory is enormously implausible. The Dave theory is rendered very implausible by such facts as the following. A. Jesus was born either in solitude, in a stable, or else in the stable under the one roof of a Palestinian peasant home. In either case, an accidental switch of babies is just incredible, since in the first case there were no other babies around. And in the second case, Mary and Joseph were under the care of the friends or relatives who owned the home. Greg tries to eliminate this evidence by denying the historicity of the virginal conception of Jesus. But clearly, how Jesus was conceived has absolutely no relevance to the circumstances of Jesus' birth, which are attested independently by Matthew and Luke. B. Judaism had no conception of a crucified Messiah much less of the resurrection of an isolated individual prior to the end of the world. Greg supposes that Jesus' twins, having somehow learned that he was the exact double of Jesus, goes to Jerusalem, and I quote, to satisfy his curiosity about Jesus, but shows up just at the time of the crucifixion. Being an unethical guy, he then conceives the idea of hoaxing Jesus' resurrection. Indeed, Greg writes, it is difficult to see how this idea should not occur to him. The revivification of Jesus would entail that God had vindicated him as Messiah, and this in turn would entail that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. But this is an outlandish, not to say laughable, scenario. Greg should have added an additional hypothesis to his theory that Jesus' twin was also a moron, because that's what you'd have to be to want to go around impersonating someone that the Romans had just crucified for treason and the Jews wanted killed as a heretic. This, this is definitely not a good role for Dave to choose. But maybe Greg would say that Dave chose to sacrifice himself for the sake of Jesus' cause. But Dave is supposed to be an unethical person, right? You have to make him unethical in order to steal and lie to hoax the resurrection. But then if he's that unethical, there's no reason why he should care about Jesus' cause. But maybe Greg can invent some additional hypotheses to take care of this. The main point is that it would never have occurred to old Dave to fake Jesus' resurrection in order to prove his messiahship. For the Jews had no idea of a messiah who would be executed. According to Old Testament law, Jesus' crucifixion showed him up for what he really was, a heretic, a man under the curse of God. Moreover, the idea that Messiah would be raised from the dead was completely unknown. Indeed, Jewish beliefs about the resurrection precluded it, since the resurrection was never of an isolated individual and wouldn't take place until the end of the world. Thus, Dave would never have come up with the idea suggested by Greg Cabin. C. Jewish tombs such as Jesus was buried in were sealed with a disc-shaped stone rolled down a groove which would require several men to remove. This makes it implausible that Dave could have broken into the tomb and stolen the body. But maybe Greg could hypothesize that during his youth Dave had traveled to Greece where he became a bodybuilder in the Greek Olympics and so he was able to move the stone. As long as you let your imagination go wild, you can invent hypotheses for anything. 
Indeed, that leads to my fourth point. The today theory is outrageously ad hoc. A theory becomes ad hoc or contrived the more it goes beyond what is already known. This is perhaps the most blatant weakness of the Dave theory. Namely, it is completely ad hoc from start to finish. There is absolutely no evidence to think that A, Jesus had an identical twin, B, Mary was not Jesus' biological mother, C, Dave grew up geographically separated from Jesus, D, Dave was unethical, E, Dave was a dumb bodybuilder, I added that one in, uh, F, Dave learned that he was Jesus' double, G, Dave came to Jerusalem just at the time Jesus was crucified, and H, Dave wanted to hoax Jesus' resurrection. McCullough emphasizes that what the historian is looking for is positive evidence for his hypotheses, but the Dave theory is constructed out of thin air. Number five, it is disconfirmed by accepted beliefs. It is universally, universally accepted by New Testament scholars and historians that Jesus was the biological son of Mary and had no identical twin. Even without all of the problems I just mentioned, Greg admits that the chances of the Dave theory being true are extremely low. But he insists that the chances are not astronomically low. But after you add on all the problems I mentioned, the chances of the Dave theory turning out to be true really are astronomically low. Thus, when assessed by the criteria employed by real historians in justifying historical hypotheses, the resurrection theory surpasses the Dave theory in every single respect, and quite decisively so in certain respects. It is therefore the better explanation. Since Greg admits that the other naturalistic alternatives to the resurrection are even more improbable than the Dave theory, it follows that the best explanation of the evidence is that Jesus rose from the dead. In summary then, we've seen that number one, Greg's view of historical justification, and especially his use of Bayes' theorem, is rejected by virtually all modern historians. Number two, when assessed by the criteria actually used by historians in justifying historical hypotheses, the resurrection theory is the best explanation. And finally, when assessed by the same criteria, the Dave theory fails miserably. I started out believing that the resurrection of Jesus was a historical event, and I went to Fuller Seminary fully believing you could establish the resurrection historically. Now, as I got into the evidence and as I looked at the argument using logic, I had a conversion experience and I was actually converted away from believing in the resurrection because of the logic of the problem. That's what I'd like to talk about now. Uh, I'd like to talk first about several logical problems with Dr. Craig's own argument for the resurrection. Then I'll spend the last five minutes talking about the twin or the Dave theory. Actually, the name Haram would be better than Dave. Okay? Uh, could I have a, a transparency number one? First of all, I'd like to distinguish three concepts of bodily life after death. Uh, I'm deriving these from Dr. Craig. Resurrection is not resuscitation. The mere res the mere restoration of life to a corpse is not a resurrection. A person who has resuscitated returns only to this earthly life and will die again. In contrast, Jesus rose to eternal life in a radically transformed body that can be described as immortal, glorious, powerful, and supernatural. In this new mode of existence, he was not bound by the physical limitations of this universe, but possessed superhuman powers. What I would like to do for you now is distinguish three concepts. Two of these will be species concepts. Resuscitation, that is, return to life in an ordinary pre-mortem body, that's like what happened to Lazarus, if that is historical. Resurrection, return to life in a transformed supernatural body that can no longer age, can no longer get sick, can no longer be injured, can no longer die, and that can materialize in and out of the, uh, this universe, the physical universe. Those I will call species concepts. I want to give a general genus concept, and that is revivification. That is return to life in some bodily form. It could be resuscitation, it could be resurrection, it could be some other form. All right. Having said that, I'd now like to present some logical fallacies uh, 
that occur in the argument for the resurrection as given by Dr. Craig and as given by everyone else who's presented an argument for the resurrection of which I am aware. So if you could please put up transparency number two. Okay. The first logical fallacy committed by the argument for the resurrection is the fallacy of hasty generalization. This is making a generalization on the basis of very little evidence or an unrepresentative sample. Now, what I've given you here is uh, a uh, parallel case. Consider the hypothesis that some mystery substance X is inflammable. Okay? If to test that hypothesis, we'd actually have to, t to submit mystery substance X to a flame in the presence of oxygen, oxygen to see if it was inflammable. If it burned, then it would not be inflammable. If it did not burn, and we tried this experiment enough times under enough different conditions, that would show that it is inflammable. We'd have strong empirical evidence. On the other hand, just to say that mystery substance X did not burn if it was not actually submitted to high heat or a flame would not be a, a genuine test of that hypothesis. Now, recall that the hypothesis that Jesus rose from the dead is the hypothesis that he could no longer age, no longer die, could no longer get sick, could not be injured. Now, the question here is, if we take the Gospels completely literally, take every word verbatim fact, do they give us sufficient evidence to establish that Jesus had these properties? These are the properties of a supernatural body. Well, it turns out they don't give us any kind of information that we would need at all. To show that Jesus had a supernatural body, we would have to submit his body to various tests. We'd have to see, for instance, if he died when he drank poison. We'd have to see if a lance could uh, cut his skin. Uh, we'd have to try different tests like that. Of course, can you imagine even doubting Thomas going up to Jesus and saying, come over here, Lord, I want you to drink some poison to see if you can die, right? No one is going to do that. That would be blasphemous and sacrilegious. So the Gospels give us absolutely no genuine tests to show that Jesus' body possessed agelessness, inability to die, inability to be injured, uh, inability to get sick. So the first problem then with the argument for the resurrection is that it does not establish what it claims to establish, and that is that Jesus had a supernatural body. We have the fallacy of hasty generalization. Okay, could you please put up number four? The next problem with the argument for the resurrection is that it commits the fallacy of false dilemma. It looks at only a selection of alternatives and, and arbitrarily rules out other alternatives. I've given two. Uh, the extraterrestrial theory and the twin theory. There are other theories as well. Now, given what Dr. Craig just had to say, I want to make a point. And that is, uh, Dr. Craig oftentimes appeals to the authority of New Testament scholars and tells you what all New Testament scholars believe or what all New Testament scholars do not believe. Now, a problem with this appeal is that it's arbitrary. Uh, it is true. No New Testament scholars believe that Jesus had an identical twin brother, an unknown identical twin. But by the same token, how many New Testament scholars at reputable universities believe in the resurrection theory? Uh, if you ask them, do you believe in the resurrection theory? They would say no. Uh, so we have an arbitrary appeal to authority here. Uh, please put up number five. I want to talk about special pleading. This, I think, is the main problem with Dr. Craig's argument and all the other versions of the argument for the resurrection of which I am familiar. This is the fallacy of employing, employing a double standard. Uh, for instance, when Dr. Craig talks about the apparition theory, that is a theory that what was seen was the spirit of Jesus and not the resurrection Jesus himself, he rejects this because there's no analogy that completely conforms to the case of the resurrection appearances as we have them. And yet, of course, we have no parallel case to a resurrection appearance. We have no apparition analogy, but we have no resurrection analogy either. And yet, that does not seem to bother Dr. Craig. Now, his appeal to implausibility. He rejects the hallucination theory, he says, because that is very implausible. And indeed it is. Mass hallucinations is extremely improbable. But by the same token, I'll come back to this, the resurrection theory is accepted by Dr. Craig even though a supernatural, let alone a natural resurrection, is astronomically improbable. It's even more improbable than a hallucination. Mass hallucinations would be. 
Third, Dr. Craig appeals to general scientific theories in an arbitrary way. He rejects the swoon theory because of our medical knowledge from physiology, right? It's very unlikely, given our medical knowledge, that Jesus could have survived crucifixion. And yet, Dr. Craig accepts the supernatural view of the resurrection theory, despite the fact that that conflicts with the laws of thermodynamics, bioenergetics. Finally, and please put up transparency number six, perhaps the main difficulty of Dr. Craig's argument is that the conclusion simply does not follow. If you take his argument and state it in its logical form, what we have is as follows. The fraud theory, that is the theory that the disciples faked the resurrection, stole the body, is a bad, implausible explanation of the evidence, as indeed it is. The swoon theory is a bad, implausible explanation of the evidence. The hallucination theory and the apparition theories are also bad, implausible explanations of the evidence. Therefore, the conclusion is that the resurrection is a good explanation of the evidence. And that simply doesn't follow. From the fact that a selection of alternative theories are bad theories, it does not follow that another theory is a good one. We have to have an independent argument to show that the other theory is a good one. And this, Craig has not provided. If you'll please put up transparency number seven now. What Craig's resurrection argument fails to show is two things. First of all, he has failed to show that the resurrection theory is a better, more probable explanation than all of the other alternatives combined. Of course, there are a lot of alternatives. Dr. Craig need not go through each one individually. He can put them together in logically mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive groups. But this he has not done. He only considers the individual theories. Worst of all, second, Dr. Craig has not shown that the resurrection theory is better than any of the traditional alternative hypotheses. He is completely right that no scholar today worth his salt would accept the fraud theory or the swoon theory or the hallucination theory. However, that is not to show that these theories are false. It is not to show that they are worse theories than the resurrection theory. What Dr. Craig has to show us is that, and I challenge him to do so, please show us that a resurrection is more probable than a mass hallucination. Do not get me wrong. A mass hallucination is extremely improbable. Yet a resurrection from the dead is even more so. A mass hallucination to Jesus' followers only would have involved 500 plus individuals having the same hallucination. The resurrection of Jesus would have required bringing back to life 5 trillion cells. There's a big difference. So I want to challenge Dr. Craig to show us that the resurrection theory is more probable than even the hallucination theory. So my point so far is even if my day theory, as he calls it, is wrong, the resurrection theory is less probable than the hallucination theory. It's less probable than even the swoon theory. After all, what's more probable? That someone who hasn't actually died on the cross should recover within a few days and appear and fool his followers? Or that a man who's died should actually come back to life again? Please put up transparency number eight. I now want to address Craig's notion of implausibility as going back to C. Bennett McCulloch. Now, he is right, of course, that practicing historians do not use Bayes' theorem. It does not follow from that that practicing historians are correct to do so. There are independent arguments for Bayes' theorem called the Dutch book arguments that show that Bayes' theorem must hold. Bayes' theorem follows from four elementary axioms of the probability calculus. But beyond that, McCulloch's own criteria of hypothesis acceptability seems incoherent. I want to refer specifically to his notion of plausibility. His notion of plausibility is a degrees concept, an incremental concept. Now, as such, it sounds very much like Rudolf Carnap's idea of partial entailment, although McCulloch does not say exactly what he means by degrees of plausibility or degrees of implausibility. But Rudolf Carnap himself would be the first to admit that the notion of partial entailment 
is a technical notion which works only for technical languages and could not be applied to any historical hypotheses at all, let alone a case like the resurrection. So what I want to suggest to you is that McCulloch's own criteria of plausibility breaks down, cannot be applied to the case of the resurrection. Now, Dr. Craig pointed out, uh, or at least tried to argue, that the resurrection of Jesus is not improbable as somehow uh, verifying Jesus' claims. If you could please put up uh, transparency number nine, I want to address, address this point. I want to talk about the problem of the theological context of the resurrection. Now, if, it, if we had other miracles, if we knew for a fact the Old Testament miracles had occurred, if we knew that New Testament miracles of Jesus had occurred, that might possibly pump up the probability of the resurrection. But as even Colin Brown of Fuller Seminary has argued, we don't have enough evidence to show that the New Testament miracles, such as turning water into wine at Cana, uh, the resurrection of Lazarus, occurred. Uh, at best, we can show that Jesus believed he performed exorcisms and that he performed healings which would today be considered psychosomatic. But that does not affect the probability of the resurrection one bit. What about fulfilled prophecies? Could that help the case out? Well, the problem is, as James Robinson of Claremont uh, Graduate School has pointed out, the Old Testament gives us prophecies that the New Testament never fulfills. The New Testament gives us fulfillments that the Old Testament never prophesied. Examples are the prophecy of the virgin birth in Matthew, the triumphal in uh, entry into Jerusalem in Matthew 21 and the alleged prophecy of the potter's field in Matthew 27. Again, if we knew for a fact that God was working in the nation of Israel to redeem humanity, that might give us some reason to feel that the resurrection has a higher probability, but again, we don't know this. That's not evidence. To assume that it is would be begging the question. And finally, the claims of Jesus. Did Jesus claim to be the Messiah? Well, that certainly is up for grabs among historians. What about Son of Man or vicarious atonement? These cannot be appealed to in this context of the argument without begging the question. Okay, could you please put up number 10 now? I want to talk about the reasons, the objective reasons for believing that a supernatural resurrection are, is highly improbable. First of all, we can appeal to observational relative frequencies. Mass hallucinations, as improbable as they are, occur with greater frequency than do divinely caused decreases in the entropy of even single dead cells. We can appeal then to relative frequencies to establish probabilities. What I'm saying is, is hallucinations occur a lot more frequently than God raises even single cells from the dead, let alone people from the dead. Second of all, we can appeal to the laws of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics put no constraints on God. They are the best evidence laws we have in physics, but they do show what God will or will not do. He acts in accordance with them. And what the laws of thermodynamics show is that a decrease in the entropy of the body of Jesus would have been astronomically improbable because that would have required a transfer of free energy from the physical surroundings of Jesus and that in turn would have been extremely astronomically improbable because at death the mechanisms that couple energy transfer are destroyed. Outside of these two factors relative frequencies and thermodynamics. We just have no objective way of determining what the probabilities would be of what God would do or not do. Could you please put up number 11 now? What really happened at Easter? Okay, we had a lot of fun with the Dave theory, and I grant you, at first it sounds incredible. And of course, if we know ahead of time, if we know in advance of looking at the evidence that Jesus had no twin, then, of course, the twin theory must be false. But, of course, we're begging the question. We're arguing in a circle. The question here is, do we have evidence for the twin theory? I say we have lots of evidence for the twin theory. First of all, I want to point out that all of the alternative explanatory theories have low probabilities to begin with before we look at the evidence. Of course, it's absurd before we look at the evidence to think that Jesus could have had a known known twin. That's highly unlikely. Of course, it's even more unlikely 
that God would have raised Jesus from the dead. Circumstantial evidence. We have no direct evidence for any of the theories. The evidence for all the theories is circumstantial. That means whether the evidence cuts for one theory or another is determined solely by whether that theory is made probable by that evidence. The final probability of the evidence on, of that theory on the evidence. What I want to argue is that although some of our evidence taken alone makes the twin theory unlikely, okay, and the evidence I'm talking about are uh, not the virgin birth stories themselves, but the, the traditions we have in the Gospels that Mary was Jesus' biological mother, even though that evidence by itself makes the twin theory improbable, if we take the entire evidence together, the twin theory turns out to be extremely probable. My old professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, Dr. Ladd, said, if you had a friend, the friend died, you saw him lowered into a casket, you saw the casket sealed, and three days later you saw your friend again, what would you say happened? And Ladd said, most of us would conclude that our friend had an unknown twin of which we were unaware. And exactly, Ladd was right. Ladd, of course, couldn't believe that Jesus had a twin because he knew a priori that Jesus could not have had a twin. But let's now ask what the twin theory can explain. If the twin theory is true, it can account for the fact that the tomb was found empty. The twin theory, contrary to Dr. Ladd, does not say the twin acted alone. He did not have to be a super bodybuilder. That is a caricature of my twin theory. Second of all, the twin theory would account for the resurrection appearances. Now, Dr. Ladd has, uh, Dr. Craig has said that the appearances were numinous in character. It is true that scholars today hold that the appearances were numinous in character, but they also hold that none of the appearances were earthly, bodily appearances. If one looks at the Gospels carefully, there is no numinous property involved in the appearances at all, except for the one to Paul. So the twin theory would account for the um, resurrection appearances, and for Dr. Craig to tell me on the one hand that it's unlikely that the twin could have ever conceived of the resurrection of a Messiah, and then on the other hand tell me that his resurrection theory is not utterly fantastic, a fantasy to me, seems just to be completely arbitrary use of logic. I mean, granted, it's unlikely for someone to come up with a new idea, but people come up with new ideas all the time. How many people have you seen rise from the dead recently? Uh, please put up transparency number 14. 13, excuse me. I only have one minute, so I'll probably have to come back to this. I want to give a non-Bayesian uh, proof or argument for the twin theory. I was told that it would probably be not a good idea to use Bayes' theorem tonight, so I'm going to give a non-Bayesian uh, argument. We begin by pointing out that well, we'll come back to that. Thank you. Before I look at the purported five fallacies in the resurrection theory that Greg mentioned, let me review my three contentions and see Greg's response to them. First, I said that Bayes' theorem is not a proper tool for historical work. Greg responded that Bayes' theorem follows from the axioms of probability theory. I don't deny that. My point, however, is that it may not apply to the area of historical inquiry because the probabilities are too difficult to assess. And he doesn't, in fact, deny the point. I think later on we'll see he actually agrees that it's very difficult to assess these probabilities. So I'm not denying the validity of Bayes' theorem, simply its applicability to history, and that's why historians simply don't use it. Now, with respect to the probability of the resurrection relative to our background information, I argued that we have no way of knowing how to determine this. Greg says either we use relative frequencies to assess the probability, or else you use natural laws. But relative frequencies is not going to work at all when you deal with unique historical events. You, in that basis, any unique historical event comes out to be uh, improbable because it is unique. You can't use a relative frequency approach to deal with unique events in history. Secondly, natural laws such as thermodynamics are simply irrelevant because the contention is not that Jesus somehow spontaneously came back to life naturally, but rather that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I admit that that's scientifically and thermodynamically impossible or wildly improbable. So that's not the relevant notion of probability. 
Greg then admits that outside of this, we have no way of determining the probabilities of what God would do. And that is exactly my point. Because we cannot determine that probability with any degree of accuracy, we cannot use Bayes' theorem in assessing the uh, probability of the resurrection of Jesus. My second point was that the resurrection is the best explanation of the evidence. And I looked at six tests, all of which the resurrection passes. Greg only chose to attack the third of those tests, that the resurrection is more plausible. He said, well, what is plausibility? Uh, after all, McCullough's notion is incoherent. Well, I think we have a rather rough and ready idea of plausibility. We mean the compatibility of one's hypothesis with the background information that's available. And you remember when I looked at the twin theory, I showed how implausible it was given the uh, facts of uh, the uh, birth of Jesus, there being no concept of a dying and rising Messiah, the way sealed, tombs were sealed in Palestine. There's nothing like that to show that the resurrection is implausible relative to the background information. And I said particularly when you consider the context in which these events occurred, the radical self-understanding and claims of Jesus of Nazareth. Greg here made the puzzling remark that it's question-begging to appeal to Jesus' radical claims. Well, I frankly don't understand this at all. It is an established part of New Testament scholarship that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand in God's place and to speak as the voice of God on matters that belong properly only to God. And any historical reconstruction of Jesus of Nazareth has to take those facts into account. And I submit that when you consider that religio-historical context, the resurrection of Jesus makes good sense in that context. It is God's vindication of these claims for which Jesus was crucified on the charge of blasphemy. Gray didn't dispute the other tests that McCullough offered, so even if we threw out one of them, we still have the other five, and I think that these provide ample justification for accepting the resurrection theory. Finally, number three, I said the, re the Dave theory fails miserably, and I tried to show why it has weaker scope. I gave two reasons why it has weaker explanatory power, three reasons it's implausible, eight ways in which it's ad hoc, and showed that it was disconfirmed by accepted beliefs. Greg responds, well, all of the theories are improbable. That's not true. Remember, we saw how the resurrection theory passes all six of those criteria. He says, but all the evidence is circumstantial. Again, that's simply not right. Look at the specific cases. The Dave theory is implausible with regard to specific aspects of the background information. It has weaker explanatory power, specifically with regard to the appearances and the wounds of the risen Jesus. He said, well, what if we saw a friend who died and was buried, and then we saw him alive again. Wouldn't we say he had an identical twin? We probably would, but here you see is where this religio-historical context is so critical. Granted that we might say that in the case of a friend, this would appear to be an, an anomaly, an unexplained and odd circumstance. But in the context of Jesus' own unparalleled life, teachings, claim to perform miracles, to be the absolute revelation of God, the Son of the Father, unique to, uh, given to mankind. In that context, the resurrection of Jesus takes on a significance which far outstrips the significance of our seeing, say, a friend on the street who died, was buried, and then we see someone looking just like him later on. Greg doesn't respond to my point about the weaker scope. With respect to the weaker explanatory power, he attempts to respond to my point about the supernatural character of the appearances by saying that they had no numinous properties. Well, I find that incredible that he could assert that. In the Gospel accounts, Jesus appears out of thin air in, in a room that's closed. He vanishes away. The disciples are frightened and stunned when they see him. His body is described by Paul as glorious um, and uh, supernatural. In the Gospels, he is also described in the same terms. As I say, no New Testament scholar thinks that these resurrection appearances were just like the ordinary per per appearance of a, of a human being uh, that would meet you every day on the street. I said it was implausible for three reasons. Uh, first, there was no switching of babies. That would be incredible. Secondly, there's no concept of a crucified and dying Messiah. Greg says, well, people come up with new ideas all the time. Sure, but they don't come up with these sorts of ideas that are so radically contrary to the 
thought system in which they've been raised is to think that you're going to show Jesus to be the Messiah by rising from the, by impersonating him risen from the dead. That just goes completely against the Jewish frame of reference. And supposedly Dave is supposed to think of this just on the spur of the moment uh, upon his visit to Jerusalem. Similarly with the tomb break in, he says maybe Dave didn't act alone. Well, maybe not, but how could he approach other people in a city he had never visited and try to enlist them in this project? If he asks them and they say no because it's so incredible, then suddenly his secret is out and the idea of a conspiracy becomes un even more untenable. So I think that the theory is extremely implausible. I showed that it was ad hoc and disconfirmed by accepted beliefs and Greg has yet to respond to that. Now what about his objections to the resurrection? First, does it commit the fallacy of hasty generalization? He says there's not enough empirical evidence that Jesus had the properties of a supernatural body. I have two responses to this. First of all, you don't have to prove all of the logical implications of a theory in order for that theory to qualify as the best explanation. For example, the special theory of relativity has the implication that if you had two identical twins and one went off on a space journey near the speed of light while the other stayed on Earth, when the traveling twin returned, the one left on Earth would be uh, very much aged compared to the traveling twin. But you don't have to confirm that empirically in order to have good reasons for thinking that the special theory of relativity is the best theory of the evidence that we do have. Similarly, the resurrection theory is an available model in Jewish thought that best accounts for the phenomena. Moreover, Jesus himself endorsed this interpretation in the Gospels when he explains to the disciples using the Old Testament scriptures how the Messiah would have to suffer and enter into his glory, that is, into this supernatural state. My second point is, however, you don't need to have all these logical implications to have the hypothesis I've defended tonight. My hypothesis can be stated as God raised Jesus from the dead. And we can simply bracket or leave aside all these questions about whether Jesus, after being raised, was immune to disease, aging, death, and so forth. The hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead best explains the available evidence that we have. Secondly, does it commit a false dilemma? He says, granted, many critics don't agree with the Dave theory, but they don't agree with the resurrection either. That's true. They are simply left in agnosticism. They have no explanation at all. And that doesn't deny the fact that the resurrection is the best one. Number three, does it commit special pleading? I don't think that it does at all. With regard to the apparition theory, I don't reject it because there's no close analogy to apparitions. Rather, I'm arguing that the appearances can't be apparitions because they're not like apparitions. But nobody's saying that the resurrection of Jesus isn't like a resurrection, and therefore it can't be one. I think Greg has just misconstrued the argument. What about the hallucination theory? It is implausible, but I think I've tried to show that the resurrection of Jesus is not implausible once you posit that God is the one who raised him from the dead. As for the swoon theory compared to the resurrection theory, yes, I think that we have to say there was a miraculous event involved here. Was it a miraculous uh, non-dying on the cross or was it a miraculous resurrection? Well, here again, the historical context provides the clue in that the resurrection takes on a significance of vindicating Jesus' claims to be Messiah and the absolute revelation of God. And therefore, that is where the miracle ought to be pinpointed, not in some sort of a physiological miracle on the cross. Fourth, do I commit a non sequitur? He says, because all others fail, it doesn't follow that the resurrection theory is the best. I don't argue in that way. I argue that the resurrection theory passes the six criteria, the other theories fail, and therefore the resurrection theory is the best theory. Finally, he says, well, what about a combination theory where you combine these other ones? Well, the problem with a combination theory is that Greg assumes that a combination theory has equal explanatory power as the resurrection theory. But here I simply disagree. Uh, for example, suppose you combine the grave robber theory to explain the empty tomb with the hallucination theory to explain the appearances. That still leaves you unable to explain the presence of the grave clothes in the tomb, which robbers wouldn't leave behind. It doesn't explain why the disciples preached the resurrection of Jesus, contrary to Jewish beliefs, rather than his translation directly into heaven. So that there are other reasons for rejecting these theories that show that the uh, combination theory is no more successful.
He says you've got to show the resurrection is more probable than, say, mass hallucinations. No, I don't. Probability is not the right concept. There is no way to determine the probability of the resurrection relative to your background information. Rather, what you've got to do is look at those six criteria, things like explanatory scope, explanatory power, less ad hocness, plausibility, and when you do that, I think the resurrection clearly emerges as the best explanation. Therefore, I am not persuaded in the least that the resurrection theory commits these five fallacies. On the contrary, I think that the most rational point of view is to believe that God did raise Jesus from the dead. Let me begin by giving the art a non-Bayesian argument for the twin theory. <clears throat> I think the issue of Bayes' theorem can actually be avoided here as irrelevant. It may be that in certain cases Bayes' theorem is inapplicable in history, but it doesn't follow from that that it's always inapplicable in history. I hold that in the case of the resurrection it is applicable and that we do know enough about probabilities in this case to apply it, but I won't argue that. Here's, my, here's a summary of a non-Bayesian argument for the twin theory. We know that mass hallucinations are extremely improbable given the psychological state of the disciples after the crucifixion, their despair, plus the number of people who claim to have seen Jesus alive after his death. So the hallucination theory has a very low final probability as well as a low initial probability. I have argued that the revivification theory has a lower final probability than the hallucination theory. Now, Dr. Craig talks about unique events, says we cannot apply probability theory to unique events. Well, we can, we do all the time in life. I argued that a even slight uh, decrease in the entropy of the dead body of Jesus would be something given the laws of thermodynamics, not that God could not do, but that God would not do. Dr. Craig has not addressed that. I never talked about a naturalistic set of laws. I'm talking about the second laws, the first and second law of thermodynamics as entailing logically what God will or will not do. God will not cause the entropy of the universe as a whole uh, to decrease according to the second law of thermodynamics we can apply those laws to see objectively whether God will or will not decrease the entropy in the dead body of Jesus. Uh, we can apply probabilities to unique events. There's a case where we can. Regardless of forgetting that for a moment, what about relative frequency data? We use relative frequency data to determine the probability of unique events all the time. For instance, let's find out what the probability is that God will cause my pen to remain suspended in the air when I let it go. Well, we could sit here all night and do this experiment and you can see that God is not causing my pen to stay up in the air. I know plenty of people who have died. God has not raised them from the dead. Uh, he has not given them a supernatural body or a non-supernatural body. We can use relative frequencies to determine uh, the probabilities of unique events. Having said that then, I still challenge Dr. Craig to show me that the resurrection theory or even the general revivification theory uh, is more probable than the hallucination theory. My argument is that it's not and therefore we've lopped off two alternatives. We've lopped off the hallucination theory in general and any kind of theory of Jesus coming back to life. That leaves one broad type of theory left. That is a theory that what the disciples saw was some sort of perceptual illusion. Now, there's only one thing they could have seen that would have made them think they saw Jesus. Could it have been an ET from outer space? Could have been, but that's enormously improbable. How about an apparition? Dr. Craig is right. A ghostly apparition would not be mistaken for the risen Jesus. What about a, a, a mere lookalike, someone who kind of looked like Jesus the way some people look like Elvis? No, because here we're dealing with Jesus' family members like James and people who were with Jesus day in and day out. There's only one type of object that could have been mistaken by the disciples for Jesus, and that is a twin, and that is an unknown twin. We do have evidence then for the unknown twin. What I'm showing you here is by process of elimination. The evidence refutes certain alternatives, leaving one left, 
and that is the twin theory. As funny as it may sound initially, and as improbable as it is relative to our background evidence, when we look at our total evidence, the twin, has a high final, the twin theory has a high final probability. Now, Dr. Craig talked about the lack of the explanatory scope of the twin theory. He says it cannot account for Paul's appearance on the road to Damascus. Well, he is right about that. I do have to attack on that Paul had a hallucination, but notice the resurrection theory cannot explain Paul's appearance on the road to Damascus by itself either. It has to assume that Jesus ascended into heaven. It then has to assume that Jesus had some kind of a miraculous power of calling light and sound down from heaven. So if you talk about an ad hoc extra hypothesis, not only are we re required on the resurrection theory to say that Jesus became alive again, but we are required to postulate that his body had these utterly fantastic properties, such as the ability to appear and disappear, to go into heaven on his, in, a, in ascension, and to call light down from heaven. Now, of course, if you assume a priori that God raised Jesus from the dead, that's no problem. But, of course, that begs the question. We need independent evidence for that. Dr. Craig has not given us independent evidence. He seems confused about the claims of Jesus and the resurrection and which comes logically prior. But sometimes he seems to argue the claims of Jesus make the, makes the resurrection uh, more likely. Then he turns around and seems to think the resurrection is a vindication of the claims of Jesus. Well, you can't have it both ways. Regardless of that, though, as I said, scholars are sharply divided about the claims of Jesus. Most scholars would say he did not claim to be the Messiah. There is great disagreement about whether Jesus considered himself to be a uh, vicarious atonement for the sins of mankind, and there is great controversy about whether Jesus considered himself to be the Son of Man. Dr. Craig cannot appeal to these claims as though scholars have accepted them. He must argue for them. He has not. All I'm saying is they are not evidence. I don't have to account for those. As far as the numinous character of the resurrection appearances, Dr. Craig is right. Jesus appears. Uh, in the upper room in the Gospel of Luke. He walks through the doors in the Gospel of John. You can't have it both ways. Uh, in Luke, in uh, the inn in Emmaus, he disappears. Now, if that is all Dr. Craig means by a numinous element, then I agree with him that the resurrection accounts as we have them today have a numinous, a numinous element. But let's look for a minute at the appearances in Matthew. Uh, the women are running from the tomb. They encounter Jesus. Uh, he says, Hail to them. They bend down and grab his feet and worship him. There is absolutely nothing numinous in that at all. How about the appearance on the mount in Galilee in the Gospel of Matthew? There's absolutely nothing numinous in that either. Uh, if we then go through the accounts in Luke and ask what the numinous elements are, the only numinous elements we have are the appearance and disappearance walking through walls. That's it. Uh, that's in John. Now, what I want to argue is this. Dr. Craig, in his very fine book, Assessing the New Testament Evidence for the Historicity of the Resurrection of Jesus, has shown us that, in general, uh, we can say we have a core of traditions of appearances. But Dr. Craig never establishes the details, the secondary details of those appearance stories. He never establishes that it is a historical fact that Jesus was seen by the disciples to have appeared or disappeared or that he walked through doors he does not establish the truth of the ascension either. In fact, in his book, he leaves out the ascension. So my point is that those cannot be counted then as evidence that the twin theory has to explain. All the twin theory has to explain is the non-numinous aspect of the appearances. It does that fine. Now, when Craig, Dr. Craig talks about the scars of the crucifixion, in the hands of the risen Jesus. Is this really a problem for the twin theory? If someone actually is going to fake a resurrection, it's not much of a problem to fake scars. I'm not worried about that at all. The twin theory easily accommodates those facts with a minimum uh, loss of probability. Let me see. Uh, let me go back to McCulloch for a minute. I, I don't have time to explain this in detail, but I think if we look at McCulloch's concept of plausibility, his concept of explanatory power, he has an in incremental degrees notion here. As I said before, he seems to have something like the idea of Rudolf Carnap of partial entailment. Well, that just is a probability notion. Uh, it seems to me he uses the idea of degrees of plausibility as a substitute notion for degrees of probability. In fact, he seems to have in mind what we would call epistemic probability. So I do not think that Dr. Craig has uh, 
extricated himself from the concept of probability by appealing to uh, McCulloch's theory of historical explanation. Now, Dr. Craig has said that the twin theory is wildly ad hoc. There are different facts that go against it that it has to add. Well, I've tried to show you through my argument by the process of elimination that we are led, first by rejecting the hallucination theory, then by rejecting the revivification theory in all of its forms as astronomically, wildly, fantastically improbable, that we have to, we are led to some sort of an illusion theory. The evidence shows this, that there was some kind of perceptual illusion. If you ask yourself what kind of object could be mistaken for the risen Jesus, it can only be an identical twin. It cannot be an identical twin that was known about by Jesus' family, by his followers, by Mary. Therefore, it had to be a twin uh, that was unknown. Finally, Mary could not have had a twin who was unknown to her. That would be impossible. So it has to be a child switched with someone else's twins. Now, has this in fact happened in the history of the universe? Well, as a matter of fact, it has. There's a famous case of Brent Tremblay and George Holmes. Uh, this case came out publicly two years ago. Uh, it was a case of twins and another woman's child who were switched at birth, grew up in the same city separately, did not encounter each other until they went to Carleton University. They were 18 years old. Uh, the members of each other's family actually saw one of the twins and mistake, mistook the twin for the remaining uh, brother. Uh, all the elements of my twin theory are here and have actually happened uh, in reality. Now, Dr. Craig says it's unlikely, in fact, I think he uses the word it's impossible to think that babies could be switched at birth. Well, I grant you, we can't see always how that could happen, but it does happen. The frequencies show that it does happen. And for him to tell us on the one hand that the resurrection theory is not implausible at all, right, when it is wildly implausible, and to tell us that babies being switched at birth is impossible. It's just a violation of the empirical relative frequencies we actually have. So I would say back to Dr. Craig that no, uh, the twin theory is not ad hoc in the ways he's described, and actually it accounts for the evidence better than does the twin theory, and I would still like him to show me that the hallucination theory is worse, is a worse theory than the resurrection theory. I'll leave him to do that now. Well, as I listen to Greg's defense of his theory, I just become increasingly incredulous at the things that he tells us. Let's look first at that point that Bayes' theorem is not the proper tool for historical work, because you cannot assess the relevant probabilities in many cases, for example, with regard to the resurrection relative to our background information. Greg still is, is holding out here for a non-Bayesian version that still depends, however, on that probability. And he's going to hold out for saying you either use a frequency method or you appeal to something like thermodynamics. Now, I frankly simply don't understand how he thinks you can use a frequency model of probability to assess whether or not historical events actually occurred. If you have an event which is unique in history, even a natural event, uh, the, the mere uh, uniqueness of that event does not show that it's improbable with respect to its historical evidence that supports it, uh, with respect to either the background evidence or what it explains. So I don't see simply how you can use a frequency notion of probability to say that because an event is unique in history and has never happened, that therefore somehow it is improbable that this thing actually occurred. You have to weigh the evidence for this thing to determine whether or not it's actually occurred, not merely it's in frequency. As for the point about thermodynamics, he says, I'm not arguing that this would violate natural law and therefore be impossible. I'm saying God would not reduce the entropy of the universe. Well, here, I must express just bewilderment as to why he thinks that. I do not understand why he thinks that God would be re uh, reluctant to reduce the ultimate entropy of the universe, especially if he wanted to vindicate Jesus' radical personal claims by performing a miracle. Uh, so, again, I simply don't see any way in which Greg can say that the resurrection of Jesus is improbable relative to the background information that we have. But unless he can say that, his whole theory evaporates because he admits it's extremely improbable, and the only reason he prefers it is because of the improbability of the resurrection. But there simply isn't any way to show that the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, is improbable relative to our background information of the world.
Second, is the resurrection of Jesus the best explanation of the evidence? He didn't deny its explanatory scope or its explanatory power. He's, he's uh, argued about the plausibility of it. He says these claims of Jesus are controversial. It is a matter of controversy, but I quoted the consensus of scholarship on this issue. Many scholars think that Jesus never claimed to be, say, the Son of God or, or the Lord or the Messiah. But they admit that he did and carried on a ministry that implicitly implied that radical self-understanding of being the unique Son of God and the unique revelation of the Father. You can even show this using the minimal 20% of Jesus' authentic sayings recognized by the Jesus Seminar, which represents the radical left wing of current criticism. So there is a consensus here, and he's got to deal with the historical evidence concerning who Jesus was. He says, but you're mixed up, Dr. Craig, because are the claims prior to the resurrection, or is the, is the resurrection the vindication of the claims? Let me explain this. I think it's very simple. The resurrection uh, uh, purportedly occurs in a historically charged context of an unparalleled life and ministry of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. That is historically well established. It is in that context that the resurrection then takes on such significance religiously as being plausibly interpreted as the vindication of those claims. So there's a sort of symbiotic, I guess, relationship between the two. The claims are the context which gives significance to the resurrection because the resurrection is seen as the vindication of the claims. He's not denied that the resurrection is less ad hoc or that it's not disconfirmed by accepted belief. So the resurrection theory really is in pretty good shape in tonight's debate. What about the Dave theory, though? I said, first of all, it has weaker scope. He says, yes, you do have to conjoin it with the hallucination theory, but the resurrection theory can't explain Paul's experience either. I think there's a difference here. To say that Jesus appeared to Paul in a heavenly uh, vision is not to propose a different, independent theory to explain Paul's experience. It's merely unfolding the narrative of the same theory. It's the independence of these elements of hallucination on the one hand and the twin theory on the other hand that makes Greg's theory have weaker explanatory scope. What about its weaker explanatory power? I argued that the appearances have a supernatural character. He said, well, in Matthew they don't. I agree, and I didn't use Matthew as an example in my first speech. We just don't have enough information in Matthew to deal with that. But I did say in Mark, Luke, John, and Paul we have this information. And he admits that in Luke and John you have such things as appearing and disappearing uh, in closed rooms and, and so forth. He says, but look, these details of the narratives are not established. But I dealt with that in my opening speech. These aspects of the narratives have multiple independent attestation in the traditions and the Gospels. And therefore, they have a positive historical credibility that Greg cannot dismiss out of hand. I was hoping that Greg would not say that Dave used makeup or other means of faking the scars of the crucifixion. To me, this just adds one more implausible ad hoc hypothesis that just reduces the theory to absurdity after a while. Uh, what about that implausibility? I said, a switch of babies is incredible. I didn't say it was impossible. I said it was incredible. He says, but it does happen today. Yes, it happens today. But did it happen in the historical context of Jesus' birth, where he's born all alone in a stable with just other animals around, or when he's born in a peasant home under the watch care of the family or relatives there? It's not credible in that context. As for the, uh, the concept of no crucified or ri rising Messiah, he dropped the point. He also dropped the point about Dave either having a conspiracy or trying to break into the tomb himself. I think it's very clear the theory is implausible. I then showed eight ways in which it's ad hoc. Now it's nine given the resurrection scars. He says, but look, I've been forced to this theory by rejecting the other theories. We're led to this by rejecting the others. But we're not led to this if we don't reject the resurrection theory. The only way you're led to this is by thinking that the resurrection is improbable. But there is no basis for saying the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, is improbable relative to the background information. In fact, and I want to close on this point, I think this shows the extremity of the lengths to which you have to go in order to deny the resurrection of Jesus. If this is what we're led to by denying the resurrection, then if I were a non-Christian, I would be shaken to the soles of my shoes 
by this demonstration. Is this what I've got to believe in order to deny the resurrection? So that I think in one sense this, this skepticism is self-condemned. It's an effete academic skepticism which to me is just utterly untenable when you consider the historical facts of the case. For my part, I think it's far more rational to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and that that is therefore the best explanation of the facts. Let's ask this question. Dr. Craig says we cannot use frequencies to assess the probability of unique events. Well, if that's true, then of course we cannot use frequencies to assess the probability of the resurrection, but by the same token, we cannot use frequencies to assess the probability of the twin theory. If we can't use frequencies, we will have no way of assessing any probabilities of any theories whatsoever. Now, Dr. Craig can't have it both ways. He can't, on the one hand, tell me that I cannot appeal to frequencies to establish the improbability of resurrection, while at the same time implicitly appealing to frequencies to show that the twin theory is improbable. Now, of course, Dr. Craig will say, I'm not talking about probability, I'm talking about plausibility. Well, then let me ask him to tell us exactly what is plausibility. I have some kind of an idea what probability is. By the way, I do not assume a frequency theory of probability, as Dr. Craig seems to have suggested. Frequencies are evidences for probabilities, although I do not hold to a frequency theory of probability. Uh, perhaps Dr. Craig is unfamiliar with that distinction. Uh, I would like to know exactly what plausibility comes to and how exactly plausibilities are assessed. Dr. Craig has not told us this. He tells us th that the twin theory has low plausibility, but he does not explain then what his basis of determining plausibility is. He has not really told us what plausibility consists in. Uh, I would like to know that before I would accept the resurrection theory or any theory. I wanted to suggest that McCulloch's idea is that of partial entailment, which Rudolf Carnap had come up with, and that view has been rejected all around. Uh, McCulloch talks about uh, degrees of implication. That's almost a contradiction in terms, degrees of implication, unless you're talking about partial entailment. Dr. Craig has not addressed that issue. Uh, Dr. Craig finds it hard to believe that God would not reduce the entropy of the universe. Well, if the second law of thermodynamics is true, it logically implies that the entropy of the universe does not decrease, and that logically implies that God will not uh, decrease the entropy of the universe. Well, then the issue becomes, do we have good evidence for the laws of thermodynamics? And as I pointed out earlier, those are the best evidence laws we have in physics. So those are evidence, objective evidence, for what God will or will not do. The laws of thermodynamics entail. Dr. Craig said, why would Kevin think that God would not increase, decrease the entropy of the universe? Well, the laws of thermodynamics entail that. And we have evidence, strong, the strongest evidence for the laws of thermodynamics. I haven't made this point, but I now will, about the resurrection's explanatory power. Dr. Craig has not explained to us what the difference between explanatory scope and explanatory power is. But let's ask this. Does the resurrection have explanatory power? He assumes that it does. But notice, it does not follow logically from the statement that Jesus becomes alive again that the tomb is empty. It does not follow logically from the statement that Jesus becomes alive again that anyone has appearances or believes in the resurrection idea of the New Testament. At best, we have probability here, not uh, entailment. So we're going to have to add some hypotheses here. We're going to have to add the hypothesis that Jesus actually left the tomb. We're going to have to add the hypothesis that he actually wanted to appear before his followers and did so. We have not just the resurrection theory by itself, but we have a whole host of other assumptions here before the resurrection theory can explain anything at all. But back to Paul. It doesn't follow logically, as Dr. Craig would have us believe, out of the resurrection theory that Jesus ascended to heaven. It does not follow that he had the power to call light down and, and heavenly voice down to Paul. That's completely different, independent, both logically independent and probabilistically independent assumption. So what I want to argue is, is that the resurrection theory is just, uh, has just a narrow uh, 
explanatory scope and power at that point, as does the twin theory, which has to, instead of assuming that Jesus ascended up into heaven, right, the resurrection theory has to actually invoke the idea of a heavenly realm. It has to invoke the idea of angels, the idea of Jesus materializing and dematerializing out of the physical universe. All that the twin theory has to add is one hallucination of one single individual. To me, that shows parsimony. It shows a much less radical assumption. Context. Dr. Craig talks about the claims of Jesus constituting the context for the resurrection. But let me go back to relative frequencies again. If we can apply relative frequencies to unique events at all, and we do all the time, right, every event is a unique event. How do we know that when a car is coming toward us, if we don't move, we'll die? We know it on the basis of relative frequencies of seeing what happens with cars. My point here is the relative frequencies are not changed one bit by Jesus' radical personal claims, if indeed he made the kind of claims Dr. Craig says. The same goes for the second law and the first law of thermodynamics. Those would not be affected materially by Jesus' claims either. I would like to ask Dr. Craig to explain to us clearly what the difference between explanatory power and explanatory scope is. I have problems with all of McCulloch's criteria. Dr. Craig himself, in his book, Reasonable Faith, questions McCulloch's idea of ad hoc assumptions, and yet he's depending heavily on that idea tonight. He criticizes my twin theory for my argument from elimination. He says, well, of course, if you eliminate the resurrection, then some kind of an illusion must have happened, and therefore that will get you to the twin theory. And he thinks it's an argument, a refuge of despair. It's absurd. But again, I want to say to you that the idea of a resurrection is much more absurd than the twin theory. And forget about the twin theory for a minute. Let's go back to the hallucination theory and to the swoon theory. Has Dr. Craig given us any evidence at all yet to show that the hallucination theory is less plausible, to use his own term, or less probable than the resurrection theory? Again, I tell you that a resurrection involves a change in the entropy of five trillion cells. Now, of course, if you assume a priori that God wants to change the entropy in those cells, no problem. But we don't have evidence for that. The resurrection is supposed to be evidence for God's activity, not God's activity, evidence for the resurrection. We have an argument here in a circle. Well, let me end on that point. In tonight's debate, I've tried to defend three basic contentions. First of all, that Bayes' theorem is not the proper tool for historical work. In his last speech, Greg says, but if you can't use frequencies to assess the probability of the resurrection, then you can't use it to assess the probability of the Dave theory either. Right. And that's why historians don't use probability in Greg's sense to assess theories. As I argued, they don't use Bayes' theorem or this notion of probability that Greg is using to assess historical hypotheses. There's no reason to think that because an event is infrequent, that therefore the evidence doesn't indicate that it hasn't occurred. He says, but the second law of thermodynamics implies that God won't reduce the entropy of the universe. Not at all. Natural laws have built into them the implicit condition that no supernatural agent or personal agent is interfering to prevent the natural operation of what the law describes. It describes ideal conditions under which the law holds. But if an agent is interfering, such as God, then of course the law doesn't hold in such a situation as that. So God doesn't break the laws of nature when he does a miracle such as the resurrection, and therefore these laws in no way imply that God will not do such a thing as reduce the entropy of the universe. So I think fundamentally Greg's whole approach to this question is incorrect. He's using the wrong model of historical explanation to assess the resurrection of Jesus. Secondly, I argue that the resurrection is the best explanation of the evidence. Greg says, what's the difference between scope and explanatory power? Explanatory scope is your ability to explain a wide variety of evidence 
available with the simplest hypothesis available, rather than conjoining a lot of independent hypotheses in order to explain the data. Explanatory power is the degree to which the specific evidence is explained by the hypothesis plus the background information that you have. And I think in the case of the resurrection and the Dave theory, it's clear which one of these has the greater explanatory scope as well as the better explanatory power. Greg says, but it doesn't follow from the resurrection of Jesus, for example, that the tomb was empty. The hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead is just your overall umbrella hypothesis. What you do within that hypothesis is then develop a narrative, such as Jesus left the tomb, Jesus appeared in the upper room, and so forth. But all of these are simply an unfolding of the narrative of this one hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's vastly different from having an independent explanation to explain the appearance to Paul and another explanation to explain the empty tomb. Finally, he says, what is plausibility? Well, I think we have a rough and ready idea of plausibility. It's compatibility with the background evidence. That's what we want to assess here. But secondly, I would say, look, if you have problems with plausibility, then just throw it out. Just use the other five tests that I've given tonight. And even using those alone, I think that the Dave theory fails and the resurrection theory succeeds. Finally, I said the Dave theory fails miserably. And all Greg retreats to now is saying, well, has Craig shown the hallucination theory to be implausible? No, I couldn't deal with every other theory tonight. I've done that in my books. But I dealt with the Dave theory because Greg says that that is the better theory than any other naturalistic explanation. So if it fails, it follows that the resurrection is the best explanation. Finally, in conclusion, I want to revert to what I said at the beginning of my speech, that historical grounds for believing in the resurrection of Jesus are not the only grounds for believing in, in that event. There is also the personal reality of Christ in the life of a believer today. I, like, unlike Greg, rather, was not raised in a Christian home and didn't come with a Christian background. Rather, I became a Christian later in life as a teenager when I began to ask the big questions in life about the meaning of life and the meaning of my death and so forth. And as I read the New Testament, I sensed there was something arresting and captivating about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And I eventually came to give my life to him in faith as his servant and disciple. I experienced a sort of spiritual rebirth in my life. God became a living reality in my life that I had never known before. For me, Christ isn't just a historical event. He's a real person whom I commune with, whom I know, whom I serve and love. And I believe that if you're searching sincerely for God, if you're searching to know him, then you can find that same reality too. I want to leave you with this challenge. When you go home tonight, purpose in your heart to begin to read the Gospels and read the New Testament about Jesus and ask yourself, could this really be true? I believe that it is and it could change your life in the same way that it changed mine. Again, I'll go back to the issue of probability. Dr. Craig says historians do not use probabilities. Probability is the wrong type of model to apply to history. Well, I don't know what historians he has read, but I have read lots of works in history, and historians uh, appeal to probabilities all the time. In fact, Craig himself uses the term probability in several of his books in, uh, in talking about the spoon theory and the hallucination theory itself. Uh, we do use probabilities in saying it's unlikely that someone would survive crucifixion. We do use probabilities in saying hallucinations, mass hallucinations, are unlikely. Uh, we use standard probability theory in showing that the independence of hallucinations makes mass hallucination unlikely. We do use probabilities all the time. Yes, Dr. Craig is correct. In many cases, probabilities are not applicable. But what I have tried to argue for you tonight is that in this case, probabilities are applicable, relative frequencies are applicable, they do apply to unique events, they do apply to resurrection, to revivification, to any kind of uh, decrease in the entropy of a dead body. Uh, what about so-called natural laws? I never brought up the word naturalism tonight. 
I never made appeal to natural laws. I appealed to the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, Dr. Craig says the laws of thermodynamics have a built-in clause that says these hold as long as no one fools around, as long as God doesn't fool around. Well, of course, natural laws could have such a built-in clause, but this is another fallacy that I haven't brought up tonight. This is what some logicians call the fallacy of under-generalization. That is where you add an ad hoc clause onto a law of nature or a general hypothesis that the evidence does not warrant adding on. In other words, our evidence is so good that to add that on actually complicates the law and we have no justification in the evidence for saying, well, maybe in this one type of case it doesn't hold. Uh, as a matter of fact, the laws of thermodynamics are the best established laws we have. They have no rider clauses. They have no uh, special condition if God does not interfere clauses. The evidence does not warrant saying that they do. Uh, they hold unconditionally in that way. So my point then is this. I've tried to show two ways in which probabilities do apply in the case of the different theories we're looking at tonight. They apply in terms of relative frequencies. They apply in terms of our general theories. We can use these to show not only that the hallucination theory has a low final probability or plausibility, because I believe that Craig's notion of plausibility ultimately comes down to probability. Okay, we can show that. We can show that the resurrection theory has a lower probability than the hallucination theory. The reason I wanted Dr. Craig to deal with that is because that's a key contention in my non-Bayesian argument. Again, I emphasize I'm not using Bayes' theorem tonight. That is an irrelevant point to bring up over and over again. I am appealing to probabilities. Then the argument is this then, that mass hallucinations are obviously improbable. Dr. Craig admits that himself. The resurrection theory, and in fact all versions, any kind of theory in which the corpse of Jesus undergoes a decrease in entropy are even more improbable than hallucination theory. Therefore, since these theories are mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive, we are left with some kind of an illusion theory. And I ask, what is the only kind of object that could be mistaken for the risen Jesus? It could only be a twin. Again, it could only be a twin that was unknown to Jesus, his mother, and his followers. It follows from that that it would have to be a twin who was not Mary's biological son. I've given you relative frequencies. I've given you cases today that you can actually verify for yourself of twins being switched not at birth. And in fact, I never said Jesus was switched in the stable. I never said Mary's son was switched in the stable. It could have been soon after birth. In fact, the one case of uh, Brent Tremblay and George Holmes, the switch happened in the first week after birth. It did not happen in the hospital. Uh, so that again is an irrelevant point to urge against the twin theory. Then we do have evidence. As I said before, the evidence for all the theories is purely circumstantial. I've tried to show you that the resurrection theory does not explain things unless you add lots of extra assumptions. You have to add extra assumptions in the twin theory as well. They both ultimately have equal explanatory scope and power as shown by Craig. In fact, the twin theory can explain a couple of things Craig's theory can't explain. The twin theory can explain why the risen Jesus was only seen in the city of Jerusalem uh, at the night. I'm, time's over.